We're going to start our series about contact tracing, talking first about how others do it, the general idea of the concept. Let's go over Taiwan first. So this is actually talking about Taiwan and what they do with quarantine individuals. I actually learned about this over a month ago, actually maybe two months ago, when my friend was saying that, you know, in Taiwan, they give you this flip phone. It seems like it's nothing, but they actually track you with it. And yes, they track you with the phone. It's not GPS, it's triangulation. It's actually a method that Google uses to try to get us more accurate information. They use not just cell phone towers, but Wi-Fi as well. The reason being that GPS is not very specific and triangulation and telling where different towers are actually is like a local GPS. And so if you see here, they have a little diagram. The idea is you come in because this is quarantine, right? So there's different ways of being quarantined. One is that you're exposed to someone, then they tell you to quarantine yourself. But if you come into Taiwan, you have to be quarantined. And so they have a tracking system and they give you this phone that you have to have on with you at all times at home. And so these are the different cell phone providers they have, <clears throat> you know, different messaging apps. And so basically what happens is if you're at home and you are there and your phone is actually off they can't tell that you're at home so they'll actually send people to check if you're at home and your phone is on they'll call you and somebody reportedly said they call twice a day and if you go out with your phone obviously then they know you're out and if you go out without your phone and they call you and you're not there, then you're in trouble as well. So this is sort of what happens to you when you come into Taiwan. It's not contact tracing, it's called digital fencing. There's a lot of concepts already of digital fencing. One is that GPS bracelet people wear when they're on parole or something. There are issues with it. There's a 1% false alert, and they said it's mostly rural areas where the cell phone towers aren't very prevalent, or if you're high up in a tall building because the cell phone tower signals get confused. But it works pretty well in terms of keeping people in quarantine and knowing that they're in quarantine and figuring out if they've left their residence. So let's look at the most famous case of contact tracing. So obviously the you know, major outbreak occurred in China and they didn't do contact tracing initially because, you know, what's the big deal, right? They just quarantined everybody, blocked off entire city, province basically. So what happens if you do contact tracing as a method of controlling the spread of the virus? Well, that's what South Korea tried. So if you look, South Korea, this is 2014, so it's a bit different, but South Korea is quite a bit denser than New York. They said maybe twice as dense. But the thing is, South Korea didn't have an outbreak in Seoul initially. It had it in Daegu. It's not a big city. Half the population lives in and around Seoul. That's actually true for a lot of countries in the world like Thailand and Bangkok I was watching this Thai martial arts movie and they said something about a third of the population lives in Bangkok isn't that crazy but it's the capital city in these countries in Asia where everybody lives or around like Incheon is actually uh, not Seoul it's where the airport is and so the question is what do they do in South Korea how much they do in terms of contact tracing. So they have this nice little diagram here. And so they have a lot of ways of getting information. So they get to access all this information from your phone, from CCTV, closed circuit TV. The credit card company will help out. Transit, a lot of people take public transportation in Seoul, the subway, otherwise there's traffic, right? 
the government and the hospitals will notify you, hey, this person has it. You want to check out who they've come in contact with? So the idea is that they share this information with all these other people and they can launch a huge amount of data. So this is talking about a journalist from the New Yorker. So he actually went and visited a guy who's in charge. So the Mapo Gu, Mapo is a district in Seoul. They have lots of districts. Song, he's the deputy of the PR department. He's a guy who sort of sends all these notifications. He goes and talks to him. So first of all, how do they get the information? Well, say they have testing centers and somebody tests positive. Then they talk to the guy, try to get where he's been, get all this information from him. Then they could go through his cell phone records, right? See where he's actually been, if he's forgotten. Say he's been at a restaurant, because that's where you know people take off their masks. You might sit closer to other people. Spittle comes out when you're eating, right? Some of us don't have the best manners and close our mouths. Actually, in Japan, it's funny because you're supposed to open your mouth wide and slurp for ramen. Otherwise, that's impolite. So they see the CCTV and they see who it is, but they can't figure out who that is. They just have a photo and they don't have, you know, the photo identification like they do in China. So they ask the restaurant for the customer's credit card information. And then they call the credit card company. Then they have the person's contact information and contact the guy and tell him, hey, you know, you're under quarantine. You're in contact with this person. Maybe you need to get tested. Right? Actually, I don't know if they quarantine the person, whether they test the person as well. Sort of a moot point, right? And they publicize it. So let me show you exactly how much they tell you. So this tells you bus transfer to number 7730 on Franga Sangam High School. Disembarked at blah blah mass worn. Six minute stop at local supermarket. Tested positive, transferred to Seoul Medical Center. They give a lot of information for who it is. You have the gender, you have the age. You know exactly where they've been. There's a lot of sketchy information, like they went to this love hotel. Those are like where, you know, you have a fling, shall we say. They name all the businesses, apartment complexes they visited, how long they've been there. Sometimes you can even identify people by this information. Docs it, they call it online. And they blast it out to every phone within a five kilometer radius. So what are the downsides? Well, I'm sure there's a few, right? So the people don't like it that they've been identified, right? There's a lot of social criticism of them saying how stupid they were. Why are they causing hurt to everybody? And local businesses get hurt. So this is Stan's Coffee. It's a pretty nice place. Actually, Korea is a cafe culture, if you've never been there. So in Seoul, you see cafes more commonly than Starbucks in New York City. And they're beautiful, nice cafes. Very quaint, very pretty. Even on Jeju, a small island, I when I biked around, you see cafes every few miles. And you could just sit there, relax. Have a nice hot drink, rest the muscles, look out of the ocean. So he interviewed this guy from the New Yorker, the owner of Stan's Coffee, Seong Hanbit. So he had a customer that tested positive. He thought, no big deal, you know? Doesn't keep up with the news, opens up again. And guess what? There's no customers. Well, there's nobody physically in the shop. Lots of people call in and ask lots of questions. And his point is, yeah, I mean, yes, remember that lady? She was there. The cashier was wearing a mask. She was only there for two minutes. It was low risk. 
but people don't go back. But guess what Song says, the guy who's actually in charge of all this information? He says you should go back. And in fact, it's safer because they send a sanitation team and clean it up. It's cleaner than ever before, right? It's sort of the concept of a broken bone, I would say. If you break a bone in your body, when it heals, it'll actually be stronger than before. Well, that part is hard to change. That's called psychology. And human beings don't change that. They're scared and they're not going to be back for a while. And the businesses are going to be hurting. But there's not much of a public backlash in Korea. It's not because they're censored. No, they're definitely not censored. It's because people trust the government. They know that this is, information can only be used for disease outbreaks like this pandemic. South Korea has very strong, stringent privacy laws. They trust the government to do the right thing. And the result, a lot of testing, contact tracing, no quarantine, at least no shelter in place like the US or many other countries, no strict quarantine like China. Well, they peaked, didn't spread like wildfire in their big city, Seoul. I would say it's a pretty good result, right? So if you look at some other places, Singapore has something called Trace Together. It's a Bluetooth based system. UK is developing something not really out for usage yet. It's also Bluetooth based, not using Google's API. But I think one big difference and why this is not exactly applicable to the US it's because we have a different culture here. You see, over there, they have a lot of trust in the government to do what's right, to take care of them. They also have an idea of monitoring themselves. And in the U.S., there's a little bit of that, but it goes both ways, right? There's the people who tell other people to wear masks, who aren't obligated to do that, like you're just walking down the street one man pulled a switchblade on another man and told him to cross the street because he wasn't wearing a mask. He had his kids with him. He thought it was dangerous. There's a security guard who told a customer to wear a mask because that's a requirement, right? He's obligated to do that. And then the customer comes back later and shoots him in head with a gun and he's dead. There's police who grab people and force them on ground when they're not wearing masks. It's not really done well, shall we say. But let's look at places like Asia, which have a much more aware culture. So this girl's wearing a bracelet on her ankle. I guess it's sort of fake, right? She should be in self-isolation. She leaves. They tell the taxi driver not to take her. Hey, she has a bracelet. Don't take her. She ends up walking away. They're shaming her. Public shame. In the U.S., people don't like that. They don't like public shame. They don't respond well. But over there, it's just life. The other thing in the U.S. is they actually don't really care about their people. You know, coming back here, I realize you go walk by some trash on the ground. You don't pick it up. Nobody is going to. There's a spill in the supermarket. Eh. You want to tell someone that you're, if you have free time. If not, who cares? You avoided it, right? Not so worried about other people. There is this case that made the news everywhere in the U.S. There's a guy bleeding to death. And many people walked by, not doing anything, not even calling the ambulance. But apparently, this case of Hugo Alfredo Taxiel 
is the only thing. A girl was beaten. People stood by. Man was hit by a car. People kept driving by. Man was shot. Someone he finished pumping kerosene and then paid for it and drove off. They're so worried. Wouldn't they just drive off without paying for the kerosene if they're worried for their life because there's a gun? This is a situation we're coming into in the U.S. with contact tracing. Where we don't trust the government. We don't care about other people. We're only doing it if it's of benefit to ourselves. So what am I to think about this? What is it going to be like? How do I prepare? I'll talk about that next. In our next talk about contact tracing and how it affects me personally and will affect you as well.